right. Hello, and uh, welcome back to Dale's uh, Study Session podcast. Um, if people were following along, they'll remember that my previous uh, locus of study uh, in these bonus series was on the Shroud of Turin. Now, after having listened to various audience feedback and sort of consulting with my co-host David, um, I've decided to end the lecture series on the Shroud of Turin. Um, but uh, coming up in April and May, there, there will be a couple of debates uh, on the Shroud. So we'll have a Shroud Wars um, debate part three and four uh, to finish that off. So yeah, what I wanted to do is basically move on to a different locus of study on the issue of substance dualism or the existence of the soul. You know, what, what the nature of the uh, soul is under a traditional Christian understanding, as well as proving that it actually exists, that substance dualism is actually true. Yeah, that's going to be the next locus of our study. And I'm not going to let it get out of control as I did with the Shroud. So I'm, I'm going to try my best to wrap this up in a in a, about four or five lectures maximum. Uh, and then we're going to end that with uh, either one or two discussions or debates with Andrew, the skeptic, uh, to see what he makes my case, whatever whatever he wants to take me to task on or to discuss, uh, we can do that. Now, this study, uh, the issue of substance dualism, pertains to a field called the philosophy of mind. And in particular, we're going to be focusing in this series uh, on what's called the mind-body problem. So I'm going to do my best to organize that for you and explain all the relevant terminology and, and categories and that sort of thing. So. Uh, at least it's sort of accessible uh, to those who are completely unfamiliar with the mind-body problem and, and the debate there. In terms of the mind-body problem, uh, basically this is uh, an issue that's principally concerned with the nature of human consciousness or, or the soul and how that relates to the human body, um, you know, how they relate or interact with each other. And principally there are two fundamental aspects uh, on which philosophers and uh, experts will disagree regarding this mind-body problem. So the first is with regards to the nature of the various properties, or for lack of a better word, mental properties and states of consciousness themselves. And the second is on the nature of the subject or the substance which bears these various mental properties or states of consciousness. So in relation to the first issue uh, of contention, let's call it that, the, the first issue of contention on the nature of conscious properties and states, there really are three major categories uh, that a person can take in terms of explaining, explaining these. So the first is straightforward physicalism. Uh, so this is the typical skeptic or atheist position that uh, there are only physical. There are only there's only one type of property. There's physical properties and physical states, uh, and that's it. And, and obviously, as we're going to find out in future podcasts, there are various versions under this physicalism category uh, of understanding the nature of uh, mental properties and, and states. The second is a dualism option, um, and there's two two fundamental varieties of that. So there's what, what uh, some philosophers call mere property dualism. So that is, they, they believe there's only one substance, the brain, a physical substance. That they're on the side with you atheists and skeptics. But the properties themselves, uh, the mental properties or states that my brain is experiencing are a different type of entity. They're non-physical properties or non-physical uh, states of mind or, or whatever you want to say. Uh, and then the second is obviously property dualism simpliciter. And this is the position I'm going to be taking as a Christian, uh, as a substance dualist. So yeah, basically we'll find out about what where they differ in the next in the second issue of contention. So that's about the nature of the substance of consciousness or, or what's the subject that's having these properties. And there's only two major categories, physicalism, you know, typical atheists and skeptics, but also mere property dualism advocates would fall under the physicalist category with regards to the issue of substance. Um, whereas Christians typically are, and what I'm going to be advocating for, substance dualism options. So there's two substances, one material or physical, that's the body and brain, and one immaterial or non-physical. Typically people will call that, you know, the mind or the soul or spirit. For our purposes, we're going to just 
they're all going to be the exact same thing. They're non-physical. Uh, it's a non-physical substance that has non-physical properties and states of mind. Okay, so as I said, uh, from a traditional Christian perspective, the Bible uh, and Christian church tradition, the vast majority of, of Christians throughout history have all said that uh, humans uh, are non-physical in nature uh, and that a human being is, as a substance, is composed of both a material or physical component of the body and an immaterial component called the soul. And the latter of which is actually capable of surviving independently from the physical body. So these are in verse, you know, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, for example. Now, furthermore, another aspect that I'll deal with, David Johnson was asking me about sort of the difference between humans and animals. So animals, from a Christian perspective, they are living creatures. And they actually have souls just like humans, um, although there's there are uh, subtle differences between animal souls to varying degrees compared to human souls. So Christians have traditionally taken, with regards to properties and states, they take the property dualism simpliciter standpoint, and with regards to the question of substance, they take the substance dualism position on the mind-body problem. Now, before, in this first part, before we get into proving, pre preventing, providing evidence that the four dualism positions, it's first helpful just to kind of give a description of what, what it is Christians are saying. What is the Christian conception of substance dualism? What is the human soul and that sort of thing? In the first place, it's important to note that there are a variety of terms used in the Bible to describe human consciousness. There is the spirit, there's the mind, and there's the soul, um, all of which can be differentiated from each other in scripture, uh, but at other times they're, they're almost used relatively synonymous in some cases. And as I said, for our series, unless otherwise stated, we're just taking them as all the same thing. They all mean the same thing. But yeah, it, it's worth it to ask. What might it mean to have a soul or spirit or a mind within a Christian context? So the human soul, as I said, is a spiritual substance that is thought to be fully present in the body, omnipresent within the body, uh, in the same way that God is said to be fully present in the universe. As uh, I'll be mentioning in one of our upcoming podcasts with David, what that means is basically human souls, uh, through the human soul, I am cognizant of and causally active at every point in my body just as God is cognizant of and causally active at every uh, point in space or in the universe. Furthermore, we also know that the soul is a complex, substantial, unified reality. Um, and it's, it, as I said, it's obviously subject to various uh, spiritual or mental properties, uh, states of affairs, relations, and, and these things inform or interact uh, with the physical human body and vice versa. Basically, they advance substance dualism interactionism. So if I prick myself with a pin, um, my body interacts with my soul and I feel a like pain sensation. Likewise, uh, states of affairs or relations in my soul can have an impact on my body. I will to, ch to raise my arm, boom, and I raise my arm. So souls and bodies stand in cause cause and effect relationships to each other. Um, this is what it means to be a substance dualist interactionist. So human human souls uh, or persons are, are thought of as a holistic functional unity uh, that is exemplified in this uh, soul. Now I was mentioning that soul, the human soul is a complex entity. It, you know, it consists of an intricate structure. Uh, and this involves various mental or spiritual states, uh, as well as various uh, faculties of the soul itself. So with regard to the first thing, states of the soul, I've, I've mentioned this uh, quite a lot. What, what am I talking about? Well, here I'm talking about states of affairs that occur within the soul, whereby a certain capacity is is being actualized or utilized in some way. Basically, yeah, think of it this way. In the same way that water can be said to be in a hot state versus a cold state, there are various states that the soul can be in uh, at any given time. And there are basically five different types of states uh, that the soul can be in from a hu based on human experience that we know of. 
Um, so the first is uh, referring to sensation. So these are a mode of consciousness whereby one has non-propositional or non-appetitive um, appetites, uh, you know, and there, there's passive experience. Basically, they happen to you. They don't come about directly by your willing them or that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're typically related to the five senses, you know, and I see a red apple, I have a sensation of red, the color red. Uh, if you prick me with a pin, I have the sensation of being in pain or a pain sensation. The second state of the soul regard thoughts. So these are propositional mental contents that convey information and they can be expressed in a sentence. Now thoughts only exist in the mind or the soul as it is being consciously thought about. So uh, thoughts don't exist in our subconscious, for example, or when we're sleeping that on their own. They're not just floating around in your soul. Uh, so to speak. Um, okay, then then the third one are beliefs. You know, we have certain beliefs that we uh, believe uh, to be propositions that we believe to be true to varying degrees. I think everyone knows what a belief is. Um, we also have desires. So something we want. Um, you know, we have certain wants. And then finally, we have volitions or acts of free will. So this assumes that we have libertarian free will. Um, you know, I'll, I'll address that later on. It's one of the arguments in favor of substance dualism. Um, but yeah, from a Christian understanding, we have libertarian free will, so I can choose or will to pick up a book or to eat an ice cream cone or something like that. So these are the five states that the soul can be in. Now there's also the faculties of the soul. So faculties of the soul basically refer to various capacities uh, or potentialities, let's say, that uh, could become actualized given certain condition. Uh, condition. Uh, and these come in hierarchies, actually. They can be categorized uh, under different categories of capacities. Uh, let's say the sensation of seeing the color red, for example. This is redness, uh, the sensation of redness. Uh, belongs to the sight capacity and then the sight capacity might be part of the sense senses faculty let's say so you have the faculty for your five senses and sight is a capacity a capacity category uh, and then the instance of seeing a red sensation falls under the sight capacity and that sort of thing so uh, there are hierarchies of these faculties uh, in relation to the co specific capacity you're thinking about. So another example that might help uh, in terms of this hierarchy, so think, having a thought about math, uh, you know, thinking about math would be said to be fall under the thinking capacity uh, category, and then this could be said to fall under the faculty of the mind. Um, so under this understanding, remember I, I mentioned in, in scripture, uh, and David wanted me to sort of clarify this, so I did some research. And the mind is a faculty of the soul. Uh, the human soul is the all-encompassing thing that is us, and it has all of these varying faculties. Um, now, interestingly, the Bible also refers to human beings having a spirit. So the spirit is actually a faculty of the soul as well. And the spirit specifically, uh, from a biblical standpoint, refers to the part of the soul that allows a person to uh, relate to God, not necessarily re have relationships to others. That's a different faculty, but the spirit faculty is how human beings can relate to God. It's a faculty of the soul. Yeah, I, th I thought that was interesting. I know that was something that um, me and David were talking about in private, and he, he found it always confused. What, what's the difference between a soul and a spirit? Uh, so now you know, uh, from a biblical perspective, the spirit is a faculty of the soul. The soul is the big, that is us, and, you know, there are these different categories within it. So, um, yeah, mo moving on. Uh, the next thing, uh, again, this is also for David, because we need to differentiate between human souls and animal souls. Uh, so that's right, yeah, I, I didn't know this until I did some research, but biblically speaking, animals also have souls in addition to having spirits, just like humans. Um, so in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew uh, nephes, which means soul, is used of animals. As well, they also have ruah, which is means spirit. Um, so the, these are used in Genesis 1.30. That's where the, the word for soul is used of animals. And in Ecclesiastes 
21, that's where the Bible says that uh, animals, uh, or at least certain kinds of animals, have spirits as well. In the New Testament, the Greek word for soul, uh, psyche, is used for animals in Revelation chapter 8, verse 9. Even fully apart from the Bible, I think we can all tell just from common sense. Animals obviously are conscious beings. Uh, they have emotions, they experience sensations, they have thoughts, desires, belief. They, they experience the states of the soul just just like human beings do. And obviously this entails that they have various faculties uh, and a, a structure to their soul um, that you know sort of organizes their, their respective capacities and that sort of thing. Now obviously with, with animals, um, trying to understand the animal soul is a bit difficult because we don't have direct access uh, to their internal mental states or internal faculties in the same way that we do have humans. We can ask a human being or we, or we know from our own experience uh, about our own internal mental states or faculties through simple introspection. Um, but we can infer using the philosophical principle of charity that, you know, dogs, for example, experience pain sensations. You prick that thing with a pen, he's going to yelp in, in pain or, you know, grimace and run away, uh, just like human beings will grimace and they'll shout ouch if you stick them with a pen. So, you know, reasoning through this principle of charity, we can rationally infer that, yeah, animals experience pain sensations and it's probably, probably exactly the same uh, that we experience it. They react the same way, they behave the same way to that uh, stimulus. So the thing with animals though is there are differences. It depends on in terms of understanding the different faculties or capabilities of animal souls, uh, it largely depends on what type of animal you're talking about. Uh, obviously certain animals are endowed with um, higher faculties um, than others. You know, um, for, for example, I mentioned the example of dogs feeling pain. Well, it's a little bit more questionable whether worms feel pain in, in the same way. Uh, do they experience pain sensations, for example? So yeah, it, it really depends on the type of animal you're talking about. Through reasoning, uh, through the principle of charity, we can ascribe various faculties uh, to differing animal souls um, in comparison to the human soul. So what are some of the similarities uh, between animal souls and human souls? So first, as, I, as I've already said, animals obviously are the most, at the very least, certain animals certainly have various sensations such as taste or, or sight or pain. Animals can also have various desires. You know, the, the desire for food, for example, is a obvious case in point. Um, animals can have thoughts and beliefs. Um, you know, we, we could, it's been scientifically proven that dogs can use mean to end reasoning. If, if they desire food, so they have desires as well, as I said, um, but the door that they normally go through to get to their, their food dish is closed. Well, they can seek out other options to get into the room, go around the other way. And animals also have willings um, in the sense that they can will to do something. But it's not, this is actually going to be a difference because it's not clear that it, it's not necessarily the same thing as volitions, which is what humans have. So. Volitions require libertarian free will as um, an exercise of power, you know, to endeavor to do something. And it, I don't think animals uh, have that. This is actually where the first difference comes into. Um, so, uh, David John, David J, this is for you. Uh, differences between animal souls and human souls. Number one, animals do not have libertarian freedom of the will. Instead. It just seems obvious scientifically that animals' wills seem to be determined by their beliefs, their desires, their sensations, and uh, their bodily states. Going hand in hand with that is animals don't have moral awareness. They don't seem to grasp key conceptual notions of morality, such as moral duties or, or values. Neither have they ever evidenced any ability to make universalizing moral judgments of a sort. In terms of desires, uh, so they, they can't really distinguish between what they desire most uh, and what is most desirably intrinsically or inherent. So they can't, they can't really work out that, oh, well, I'm desiring food, but actually I should be desiring something that's more worthy or something like that. Altruistic behavior. This is another 
um, difference that some philosophers lay out. Because really, I, I think that altruistic behavior in animals really comes down to base desire. It, it's they want they want something out of it. It's it's not really based on a moral duty or or some sense of intrinsic value in helping others. Put it that way. And another difference that goes hand in hand with the the above differences. Animals do not appear to have conflicts between their desires uh, and their their uh, felt duties, such as you know, moral duties or epistemic duties. But they can experience a conflict of desires on occasion. So, for example, a dog might have a desire to bite a chair, but he, he has to balance that. Uh, there's a conflict with his desire not to get hit or spanked if he, if he bites the chair. Uh, but animals never exhibit a conflict between a desire and a duty like human beings do. Um, you know, so such as saying, well, I have a desire to bite the chair, but I have a duty not to bite the chair because that would be wrong. It would hurt my owners. Uh, he would have to pay and buy a new one or something like that. Another difference is animals do not exhibit the capability of having abstract, complex thoughts. They show no evidence of being able to think about what is it, what does it mean to love, what is love in general? or have some kind of universal general concept of what is truth. I mean, they, they can't even think of, there's no evidence that they can think of what is food in general as an abstract complex thought. Uh, animals just aren't capable of that or haven't shown any evidence of that. Another difference, animals can't distinguish between true universal judgments versus mere statistical generalization. So they can't tell the difference between all crocodiles are dangerous versus most crocodiles are dangerous, statistically speaking. Another difference, um, so here's here's one that I'm, I'm sure David would know about. Uh, this has come up in the unbel some unbelievable shows, but animals only have first order states of the soul. They, they don't evidence any second order states of affairs. So for example, they don't have desires about their desires. For, for example, humans, I can desire not to desire smoking cigarettes or, or not to desire drinking alcohol. Um, I can have beliefs about my beliefs or thoughts about my thoughts. Animals are not capable of second order states of the soul. Finally, one last difference is, and this is co somewhat controversial. I, I know that uh, Andrew and uh, Matt actually did an Ask an Atheist episode, uh, Ask an Atheist Anything episode about language. Uh, but I'm gonna go out on a limb. I, I don't think animals possess language. like like human beings do. Now, what does happen? There are scientific experiments that show that animals can obviously be trained to recognize what are called signs, okay? But they, they don't seem to understand the use of symbols. Humans get symbols, animals only get signs. Um, and symbols are what are required for um, an animal to have real language, for there to be real language. So this also comes up with you know, the issues of computers and artificial intelligence as well. So as an example, so the word banana, this is a symbol, right? It represents and or refers to actual bananas uh, on a conceptual level. So we associate the word banana as a symbol that represents actual bananas. Animals don't get that. Um, animals just have signs. So. Signs are merely sense perceptible objects that through experience, an animal can come to habitually associate uh, with an actual banana that comes out afterwards. Um, but the way to illustrate this difference, you could do that with anything. It doesn't have to be the word banana. You could put uh, alligators up there or you could put uh, soul up there. And again, through that habitual sense perception, giving them a banana right after they see that word, they'll come to recognize that sign. Oh, okay, he shows me this, then I get my banana or I get my food. Um, so that's, that's the difference. Animals don't recognize um, symbols like humans do. Uh, they can only recognize signs. So therefore, I don't think they possess language. And again, this is more somewhat controversial, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump out. I'll take a, take a leap and say, I don't think animals have language in the same sense that humans have it. They don't have a real language. So yeah, you know, just sort of closing off the animals thing. Well, obviously why animals do have souls, 
uh, they're not as richly endowed as human souls are. They, they lack several faculties and capacities that humans have, and this is why they're not considered to bear the image of God um, like human beings are. So yeah, hopefully you appreciated that. I did, I did some research on the differences between the human soul and the animal soul for David there, so hopefully the rest of you listeners enjoyed that. Okay, so now we're coming to the final section of of the part one on substance dualism, and this is going to this is going to be the most technical aspect. I, I'm trying. I'll try to simplify it for you. But when I when I say Christians, okay, so Christians are property dualist simpliciters, and also with regards to the subject or substance, they are substance dualists. Dualists. They have a there is an immaterial substance, the soul, and there is a physical substance, the body. But it's important to note that. There's a wide variety of opinions as to what subs the specifics of what is substance dualism. They're not all the same. There are a variety of views uh, and versions of substance dualism that I, I think you guys sh should kind of get familiar with a bit. For the most part, while all the arguments for and against the existence of a soul can apply equally to all the versions of substance dualism, there are some exceptions, as as we'll see. I'm going to point out one of the major ones, but. Um, yeah, I think it'll be instructive to cover the three main versions of substance dualism, just to give you an idea of some of the the differences between Christian scholars and that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll, I'm providing sources for each version below for you guys. So, so yeah, um, the first thing to note, substance dualism. Okay, that means there's two substances, right? Uh, no. So here, here's where it gets a little bit confused. That is slightly misleading. Not necessarily. Substance dualists don't necessarily make the claim that there is a dualism or two independent or separate substances. Some versions do, do in fact posit this as we're going to see, but it's not necessarily the case. So f for our purposes in the rest of this series, unless it's otherwise mentioned, the term substance dual dualism will only minimally entail that there is an immaterial self soul, mind, eye, whatever you want to call it, uh, and that is not identical to the material physical body. So there's a non-material or non-physical soul uh, that is essentially us. It is the eye, the essential eye uh, of human beings, um, and it's not identical to the physical body that we have. This is our minimal definition, and when I go through some of the examples, you'll, you'll kind of get why I'm defining it this way. So yeah, let's let's get into the first uh, of the three ver major versions of substance dualism. So this is one of uh, the most popular one. Um, I think it's the one I sort of lean to myself. Uh, I'm not dogmatic, but uh, this is known as the Thomistic, uh, standing for Thomas Aquinas, or Aristotelian-like dualism. These types of theories, uh, there's multiple subversions of, of these types of substance dualisms, not all of which posit two different substances themselves. Um, in fact, I, yeah, I don't think any of them do really, but it's so it's dualism, not substance dualism. So it takes my minimal definition. And the, the type that we're going to focus on here is the most important one uh, called metaphysical Aristotelianism. So this really came uh, around in its most advanced form around the late medieval period. Uh, it's, it's been sort of modified recently to be consistent with, uh, in science, information theory. Um, you'll see a lot of intelligent design proponents in the intelligent design movement. Bill Dembski or, um, what's his name, Wells, uh, I forgot his first name, John Wells or James Wells, uh, the biologist Wells, who's an intelligent design proponent uh, in modern biology. They are typically Thomas. Uh, other proponents, you know, obviously is Thomas Aquinas. Um, there's modern philosophers like Eleanor Stump, Peter Kreft, and J.P. Moreland. They're all, uh, in one way or another, part of this Thomistic or Aristotelian understanding of dualism. So what is this? Okay, so basically the view is based on Aristotle's notion of classical essentialism. Uh, if you remember, I, I mentioned essentialism in my blog with uh, David on his part one, why, why he doesn't care about the Bible. and. I was talking about virtue ethics and the ideal human nature. What is it essential? 
you know, to what is the the ideal human nature? What is essential to being a human? You no, know, here here's the key with this thing. So in, in this type of dualism, the body, the physical body, is actually seen to be a part uh, of the soul itself. You know, as as opposed to viewing the body as sort of a separate substance uh, all on its own, or or a bundle of physical properties, and and then we have the soul in addition to that. So so basically, the soul. The soul would be defined in the same way as others. You know, we have the mind, we have the spirit, we have all these various mental faculties and that sort of thing. Uh, these these mental or spiritual properties and states that are non-physical in nature. But also we have, f the soul also contains physical uh, states and physical properties uh, as expressed in the body. And, and the soul is said to be necessary to enliven or animate and as well teleologically develop the physical body. Yeah, as, as weird as it might sound, under this type of view that the body is actually a mode of the soul itself rather than a separate substance. Um, so the soul can exist without the body. It can be sustained in existence by God, but not vice versa. So a body without a soul is a corpse. There's no, no life force for lack of a better word that animates the physical body just sort of continuing on so so yeah basically the, bo the body under this is seen as a literal functional entity uh, of the soul um, and the soul the soul is seen the the human organism uh, is seen holistically and this is where it gets uh, support in intelligent design or information theory um, in modern biology, we have what's called organicism, and this is actually growing in popularity among secular biologists. There's this understanding that the, the human, the self, the I, or, or the soul, in a biology terms, or infer, you could put it as an analogy of information, stands above and beyond its physical parts and dictates how those physical parts like DNA or how your body is going to develop. It provides the goal, the teleological goal, sort of like a blueprint provides the teleological map of this is governing how your physical body is going to come about. And in this theory, the, all theories say that the soul is holomerically present at all points in the body. That was the term I was looking for before. This is a holomerically. That's a fancy word for meaning omnipresent. It's, it's present in all points of your body simultaneously, uh, yet without spatial extension. Pff, sounds like that's incoherent. Well, we'll, we'll find out in uh, our show addressing omnipresence, but it's actually not. Uh, everyone agrees. Ma mathematicians, secular mathematicians all agree with me. It's, it, it's the same as saying, look, the soul it lacks spatial extension, even though it's spatially located in your body. Um, so it's kind of like saying, look, in math, points are spatially unextended. Well, the soul is like a, a mathematical point uh, that lacks spatial extension. But that's the same analogy that we use for God's omnipresence. God, God is like an unextended point in relation to s space or the universe. He is holomerically present at all spatial points in the universe. Uh, same with us. Our souls are holomerically present at all spatial points in our bodies. What would be, I was trying to look uh, at sort of skeptics and really the biggest objection to this view, to a, a Thomistic or a Aristotelian or metaphysical Aristotelian understanding of substance dualism is that it, it's unscientific or it's, or it's been scientifically falsified because it entails what's called vitalism, right? Uh, meaning li life or something. So, so vitalism usually entails there's a spatially extended essence or f life force uh, or, or, you know, in times past, physical fluids, you know, like caloric or phlogiston fluids that exist in the body. Uh, and, and this is your soul and this has spatial extension. So your, your soul is spatially extended throughout your body. So part of my soul is in my leg, part of my soul is in my arm. Uh, as either a fluid or a force um, of, of some type. Um, and obviously, scientifically, this has been falsified. This is complete rubbish. Uh, it's a wrong. It's not true. Um, and this is the biggest objection that skeptics will, will lay to these type of, uh, this type, this version of substance dualism. 
However, the skeptic is just plain ignorant here because he may be right about the problems with vitalism, but it's not the case that all metaphysical Aristotelian uh, substance dualists believe this. We, there are versions of the theory, as I said, where the soul is holomerically present at all points in the body. It, it lacks spatial extension, just like an unextended point in mathematics. Um, now, how, how would this work? So uh, David Johnson actually is, has somewhat done my work for me because the close analogy, this is where information theory comes in, is information. You know, modern biologists and intelligent design proponents view information as a sui generis, which means a unique genre uh, of an irreducibly immaterial entity which teleologically guides and develops all the physical entities of the body, including our DNA when we're being formed in the womb, our proteins, RNA, um, and uh, subsequently our, the rest of our physical body as we live our lives. In effect, the soul can be conceived of being like information in D, within DNA. Um, it's a, it's a non-reducible type entity, um, and it can be seen as sort of constituting the master blueprint for the body. The body is an extension or mode of the soul itself, and the soul dictates the events of the, the body. So that this is, kind of provides us a plausible mechanism of how the how the soul interacts with the body, how it works, because it's it's the same way that information can be said to interact with DNA. Just swap out the word inf information and put soul. Yeah, so that's the first version of substance dualism. I, I hope that made made some sense. Um, what's the second version? Uh, and this is uh, Cartesian dualism. I think this is what most of us think of. Most lay people think of when they're thinking of substance dualism. What is that? Um, so Cartesian dualism is based uh, again, just like Thomistic or Aristotelian, has various subversions that are you know closely related and that sort of thing. But they they started with Rene Descartes, you know the the guy of I think therefore I am uh, level fame, and it's adopted by various contemporary philosophers such as Richard Swinburne. Uh, Stuart Goats and Charles Taliaferro, uh, and Richard Swinburne and Stuart Goats. Uh, I think they're they're uh, included in some of my video sources that I'm providing you guys in part one. Okay, so what, so what is the main difference that Cartesian dualists uh, have that differentiates them from Thomistic or Aristotelian uh, dualists? And basically, this is comes down to the fact that look, they reduce the soul to the mind. Uh, or the, the non-physical or immaterial substance uh, that exemplifies pure consciousness and all those mental states and properties and that sort of thing. But that's it. The body is not a mode of the soul. The body is, is a separate substance, totally separate substance. It's a machine, um, you know, totally physical and, and that sort of thing. The, the body is, is more sort of like a physical property thing or a myriological aggregate of physical properties, a conglomeration of sorts of all these physical properties, uh, as opposed to seeing the body, the physical body as an, as a mode of the soul itself. They're, they're just, here's a good way of saying it, the ghost in the machine. Uh, let's put it that way. Yeah. The, it's the ghost in the machine type view that was, that is very popular. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of the main difference with Cartesian dualists. Yeah, the, the entire mind-body relationship for, for Cartesian dualists uh, isn't one of sort of, you know, like an, in how information provides a blueprint for the mode of the soul and provides a teleological goal for the development and, and, and uh, movements of the body and that sort of thing. It's one purely of external causal relationships. Uh, so there's, you know, the, obviously with, with interactionism, this is a two-way cause and effect uh, process. So I gave you the thing, I, I can will in my soul to raise my arm, and my body responds accordingly. Likewise, I can be pricked with a pin, and my soul feels a pain sensation. Um, so they're, they're the same that way. Um, now as to the spatial location of the soul uh, under Cartesian dualism, uh, there are some differences. So some Cartesian dualists will claim that the mind is not spatial in any way. It, it, there is no spatial location and there's no spatial extension at all. 
Uh, others hold that it, it is located, spatially located at some place in the body, for example, uh, but it's not spatially extended. And then the final view, this is the one I, I'm advancing, obviously, just like Thomistics or Aristotelian uh, dualists, uh, it's whole, the, the soul is whole and merically present in the body. It's fully present in every single place in the body simultaneously. You know, it's, it's a, a whole entity. It's, whole, it's a holistic approach. It's fully present at each spatial point within the body's spatial boundaries itself. So, you know, my soul isn't 20 feet away from me. It's only within the parameters or boundaries of my body's spatial location. Basically, there are three sort of major arguments against uh, Cartesian substance dualists. Uh, most of them are garbage, but here's the most substantial one for starting. So it's what's called the causal pairing problem. Okay, so I, I said that under a Cartesian understanding, the body and the soul stand in external cause and effect relationships with each other. That's, that's how they interact with each other. And the causal pairing problem is so some philosophers have said, well, how do you pair up a certain cause in the soul with a certain physical effect in the body or vice versa? How do you, how do you pair that cause and effect? Um, you know, we, we understand on a pure physical level, if I aim a gun at uh, Bob and boom, I shoot the bullet, we can, that's the cause and I can pair that to the effect because I can trace the bullet, I can see where it, the gun is aimed, I can trace the bullet's path and boom, it hit, bada boom, bada bing, it hits him, and uh, yeah, we can pair the cause and the fact physically. Uh, this objection basically says, well, well, how do you do that with a spiritual and or physical cause to a spirit, to the opposite effect type thing? So in the first place, this is just pure question begging on the part of skeptics, and it's outright false um, because it's assuming Oh, well, spatial feature, it's assuming that spatial features are necessary conditions for causality. They're not. Um, neither is it necessary for causal pairing. Uh, we can clearly, using our modal evaluating faculties, clearly conceive of possible worlds without space. Um, but yet where causes still result in effects. Modern cosmology uh, and quantum physics is full of it. Quantum indeterminacy agrees with Cartesian dualists here, you're dumb. You can pair the cause and effect to each other. Yes, it, it's outright pr proven false that spatial features are necessary conditions for causal pairing. Another counter, some experts have actually pos postulated that there could even be a non-spatial metaphysical analog to space. This is conceivable using our modal evaluating faculties and experts have uh, shown this to be the case mathematically and that sort of thing, but think of it as sort of a metaphysical grid that can provide a non-spatial location for each soul uh, and which is then sufficient to pair it with its corresponding physical body part uh, on a spatial plane. Uh, so this is an argument advanced by another expert, Timothy O'Connor. He's done a lot of work on this, meta this notion of a metaphysical grid which causally pairs a immaterial soul with a physical body or substance. Another argument again, another thing against this causal pairing problem is, well, that, look, there's a difference between general and singular causation. So most physical causes in the universe are examples of general causation. They, they follow sort of like a law-like structure, like a law of nature and that sort of thing. So, you know, the, the causes will... General causes will produce the same general effects in all, in all and or most instances. If I smoke, uh, that will, uh, the cause of my smoking will produce an effect in me of having lung cancer over time. And that's, so that's sort of the general notion of general causation. However, some philosophers postulate, yeah, but there's also instances of singular causation. So the interaction between a spaceless Cartesian mind and its body could be an example of what's called singular causation here. So it could be that God created and designed specific souls only to interact with specific bodies. Um, and if that is the case, then there's basically nothing you skeptics can say about this causal pairing problem. Specifically created each soul to interact specifically with each body. 
then the causal pairing problem is immediately solved. And then there's finally our, our, the last counter to this causal pairing problem. And it comes from this. Many Cartesians don't claim the mind is spaceless, uh, even if they do claim that the mind or soul has no spatial extension. So this is the view I take. I believe that souls do have a spatial location, but they're not spatially extended. Yeah, g given this, this would answer this causal pairing problem if it's holomerically present in the entire body, and the body itself is spatially located. So the soul would be located in the, within the boundaries, the spatial boundaries of the body. Okay, so here's the second major argument against uh, Cartesian dualism. This is, this is just garbage in my opinion, but it, it basically says, look, you're, you're saying the soul exists as an unextended mathematical point, yet in a specific place in the body. So, okay, so where is it? Uh, why is it there versus someone else? So he's going, this argument's going against Cartesian dualists that argue that, look, the, the soul is present not holomerically, you know, omnipresent in all of the body simultaneously, but it's in your brain or it's in a specific part of your brain or it's in your finger or something like that. And you saying, well, why there? You know, that's just arbitrary. Um, this is the this is the objection. So, yeah, th this is really I don't know. This is just a dumb objection in my opinion. There's no argument here. There's no evidence as to why the mind can't be located at several points as one at once, holomerically. Um, you know, just saying, well, I don't buy that. Yeah, but it's like triangularity. We we may not be able to imagine imagine that sort of thing, but it is perfectly intelligible and conceivable. Um, so just because the skeptic can't understand what it might mean for a soul to be omnipresent in its body doesn't mean that it's not conceivable. Also, even if the mind or, or the soul is located in one uh, particular location in the body, say in the brain somewhere, just because uh, we have an inability to know where the soul is par in particular, what part of the brain, or why the soul is located in that particular place versus another, um, this is just an example of our cognitive finitude. Um, I mean, who cares? There's a lot. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle proves that we know some things about stuff, um, but not all things about a particle, for example. Does that mean particles don't exist? And that's the same thing skeptics are doing here. They're trying to say, well, you can't describe everything about, you know, where it is or, or why is it there versus another place. Therefore, it's not real. No, that's not the way logic works. Um, sorry, skeptics, on that one. Another objection, though, is also, look, why not treat souls as though they're odd material objects as opposed to a different substance? In order to answer this, I, I would just say, so skeptics will, will say, why, why postulate that the soul is a different substance? Why not just say it's some kind of odd material-like object? It's a physical object, but it's just odd. It's, it's a anomalous and not the typical way matter usually reacts and that sort of thing. Well, the answer to this is simple. Occam's razor. This is not a simpler solution. I'm sorry. When an indiv indivisible, uh, unified soul, not composed of parts, is far simpler than any physical entity that we have no evidence for exists and that's totally different from every other physical object on the earth. Yeah, this is just ad hoc on the part of skeptics who are desperate to try to prove that substance dualism is false. Okay, finally, a third argument against Cartesian substance dualism. And it's again, so if the soul is spatially located, like an unextended version uh, mathematical point, how could, it, how could a soul have enough structure uh, to do all the causal work attributed to it? It has all those faculties and capacities uh, and internal states that are going on within it, you know, thoughts, desires. It would have to. It would have to be spatially extended, you know, kind of like stacking oranges one on top of the other. Eventually, it's going to fill the room, and you'll run out of space. It, it needs. There needs to be ex spatial extension to have such a complex structure. So again, here's where skeptics are totally out to lunch. I mean, thoughts and desires, or or, you know, the the various states of mind or states of the soul, they don't have spatial extension or relations either. I mean, it makes no sense. You're, you're utterly absurd 
to, to ask the question, my, you know, that, that desire you have for an ice cream cone, is that to the left of your thought of, of your thought about um, going to church on Sunday? Uh, and is that to the left of your sensation of seeing a red apple? These types of spatial questions don't make any sense regarding mental states of affairs or mental properties. They don't have spatial extensions. So therefore, you know, the, the structure of the soul is complex. It could have a potentially infinite amount of thoughts, desires, blah, 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 and none of this would require spatial extension. I, I would say the most substantial argument against the Cartesian du substance dualist version is the first one that I gave. The, the latter two are just skeptics desperately trying to find a fault, but, you know, they're, they're just garbage objections. So the causal pairing problem is, is where I would focus, and I gave those four answers that refutes the causal pairing problem. Okay, uh, finally, the third and final version of substance dualism. And this one I don't cater to at all. I think it, it's outright false, but it's called the, it's more modern. It's called the Haskarian uh, substance dualism option. So this is a, a more recent view, uh, and it's, it's more consistent with atheistic scientists and that sort of thing. It, it's developed by Dr. William Hasker provided a couple sources by him. He basically says, look, when, when matter reaches a certain level of complexity, a new emergent substance, substance, i.e. the soul, emerges from the matter. So it's a form of emergentism, uh, although he's not saying just mental properties or states emerge out of complex physical arrangements. A new substance itself, a soul, emerges brand new once matter reaches a certain level of complexity. So Hasker believes that the soul is spatially located and spatially extended in the brain. That's his downfall right there a lot. Um, and obviously it's, it's spatially extended in the brain. So this is unlike most other versions of substance dualism that traditionally Christians have taken and that I myself uh, take in regards to the, the soul because we say that the soul is not spatially extended. Now, as I said, th this view does seem to be more agreeable to modern science. Why would I say that? And I think that's part of the appeal that Hasker is, why it appeals to, to Hasker. He can say, see, I, I'm almost with you guys, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too. I still got a soul, uh, but I'm not denying the necessity of the brain and that sort of thing. And there, there are these uh, various experiments where they have their uh, corpus callosum, which connects the two hemispheres of the brain, temporarily disconnected from each other, so they can't communicate with each other. And under this experiment, uh, you know, you cut off their fields of vision, their uh, left side from the right side sort of thing, and you put key on the left side and then you put right and then you put another word on the uh, ring, key ring. So you have key on the left, ring on the right. You ask that person, okay, uh, ring. I, th because the left side of your brain covers uh, verbal cues and the right side of your body, you'll point out ring. You'll say the word ring and you'll point up your right finger to point at the word ring. Um, the right side of your brain controls your left thing, but it doesn't control speech, so you won't say anything, and you'll go and you'll point to the word key. So Hasker, just like modern skeptics, will ridiculously say, "See, that proves you're you're becoming two two selves. There's not just you know a unified self anymore. There are actually two selves." And Hasker agrees with this nonsensical notion of the skeptics. Uh, and he says, see, I'm right there with science. There are two separate souls now, and they emerge from... So, so yeah, um, no, from a, a traditional Christian perspective, this is obviously false. Um, but nonetheless, this is a scientific experiment. You, we can't just ignore the, the data that this happens. So how would a traditional substance dualist, a Thomas um, a slash Aristotelian, or a Cartesian dualist, like what I'm going to be arguing for, answer this phenomenon that takes place, uh, where it, it seems the brain is split, uh, and a lot of scientists will say, see, there's two different selves at that moment. So the first is that we have to remember, look, these people, after the apparatus is removed, after the experiment, the split brain experiment is over, 
these people go right back to being a united whole again. They live their lives normally. They're not two different selves in one body. They're one self again. And it doesn't make any sense scientifically as to why removing, you know, physical equ scientific equipment or apparatus would you reunite two cells back into one. It just doesn't make sense. It, or would it, or would eliminate one of those newfound emergent souls altogether, you know, reducing you back down to one in the body. It's just terribly ad hoc and ridiculous. It, it, it seems that another interpretation more consistent with traditional Christian substance dualism makes better sense of the split brain experiment data. What would that be? Well, we have um, what's called the switch model interpretation. Um, so this is basically a view. If you're going to take a Hasker view, which I don't, but you could say, well, look, the soul alternates in rapid succession from hemisphere to hemisphere. Um, and this is what preserves the unity of what's called phenomenal consciousness um, or the soul, the phenomenal soul. Um, now, I, I haven't gotten into, I'm going to be getting into more details about this in part two when I start getting into describing properties or, or states of the soul and that sort of thing in more detail. But uh, in order to answer the this objection, so there, there are different version there are different types of consciousness. Um, so there's phenomenal consciousness and there's also access consciousness. So in the, in order to answer this and you say, well, the, the soul could uh, stay united and you know, transfer from uh, in rapid succession from hemisphere to hemisphere, and that preserves a unified phenomenal consciousness. Uh, so, what is what do I mean by phenomenal consciousness? Well, uh, the phenomenal consciousness is your is your basically yourself. It, it's your unified uh, soul uh, that provides all of the uh, phenomenal qualia or conscious states that you experience and for lack of a better word it's the it provides you with the what it is like to see red or to feel pain and and that sort of thing however the experiment shows that there is a division that occurs so if the phenomenal consciousness needs to remain you unified uh, what is it that's creating this data of division and that's because I think there's a division of access consciousness um, so what is that so basically access consciousness, right? Think of consciousness that you have access to. So it only applies, it's a state of consciousness that comes about if and only if that state is available for one, guiding speech and verbal reports, two, directing and controlling action and body movements, or three, use and reasoning. So that it's gotta be actively uh, or directly accessible to the person and uh, that's what we're saying is divided here the right side of your brain only has access the uh, access to the key on the left and then the left side of the brain only has access to the the ring on the right or whatever you want to say um, in these in these experiments and that's explaining why you're getting the two different uh, interactions even though on a phenomenal level, the consciousness is still unified. And when you take that little, the apparatus away and you finish the experiment, they go right back to having a unified access consciousness as, they're, as they did before. Um, so that, that's sort of the explanation um, as to how we explain these split brain experiments that seem to support um, Hasker's notion that there can be two selves, two souls type thing in one physical body that emerge out of complex, you know, physical processes. So, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, that should be it for part one. Uh, hopefully this made some sense to everyone. Uh, next time, um, we're going to get into evaluating the f first aspect of the mind-body problem. So, we're going to focus specifically not on the substances themselves, but evaluating the nature of mental properties and states of affairs within the brain. Um, are these just physical states, or is there a dualist uh, notion of mental of properties and uh, states of affairs that make more sense? So yeah, uh, that's what we're going to be doing next time. I'm, I'm going to.